Hello, I am Eva Kimby, and I am a professor of hematology at Karolinska Institute here in Stockholm. And I've been working with lymphoma since many years, and one of my main interests are people with Waldenström macroglobulinemia. And now I today want to discuss a case with you, and that is an elderly gentleman. He was a former school teacher when he first showed up with signs of anemia and hyperviscosity. He had headache, he had breathlessness, nose bleeding, and a blurred vision. And he also had a spleen, which was two centimeter palpable. And he also had a typical skin rash. And I want you to just look at the slide on the schnitzel syndrome, because that is a monoclonal EDM gammopathy. You could think of when a patient has skin problems. But in the schnitzel syndrome, they also have bone pain and intermittent fever, arthritis, enlarged lymph nodes, and hypothyroidism hepatitis pleonomegaly sometimes, and always a very high elevated ESR. This patient, uh, he was not a typical uh, uh, Schnitzler syndrome. He had a high EGM, 78 gram per liter, and he had a beta 2M of 4.6, low hemoglobin of 82 gram per liter, deciliter, and his platelets were 100, and also the serum albumin was a bit low. The uh, international prognostic scoring system, which is very important for patients with Wallenstrom when you are going to decide which kind of treatment you want to offer them. This patient, he had, you know, many of the high-risk scores, so his uh, survival, expected five-year survival, could be as low as 38%. So now, what kind of treatment did you want to offer for this patient? Single agent, as he's an old gentleman, or a rituximab-based combination? Uh, I always look at the guidelines, and they are often updated with new information. And for this patient, there are several options. If you look at the only really big randomized trial for patients with Waldenström, this is this publication from Dr. Leblond and her colleague showing that fludarabine is much better compared to chlorambicil, but still the progression-free survival is not very exciting. And moreover, the albumin and age of the patient makes it not so good. So, looking at fludarabine combinations uh, like uh, FC or FCR, which is so effective in CLL, in Waldenstrom you get more hematologic toxicity. You have mostly grade 3 and 4 neutropenia during some of the cycles at least, and some of these cytopenias are very long-lasting. And also you have the depletion of some of the T cells, foremost the CD4 cells. One more problem is infections. And also in some patient transformation to a higher grade lymphoma could happen. And also an MDS or even an acute myelocytic leukemia. I wanted a lower toxicity combination. And here you have some, the DRC, the one cyclophosphamide, prednisone, and rituximab together, or the bendamustine rituximab. All published trials uh, with these regimens which have been uh, having good efficacy. So the DRC was the treatment choice for my patient. He got dexamethasone, rituximab, and cyclophosphamide, and the cyclophosphamide was given orally, and the courses were repeated every 21 days. Previous results from this DRC, published by Dr. Dimopoulos and also updated at some ASH meetings, show that this treatment is very effective. 
and you have also a rather fast reduction of the EGM. But there is a risk still to have an EGM flare. So, in my patient, I started the treatment with a plasmapheresis to get the EGM removed, to reduce the risk of the flare. Also, in this case, in special this gentleman, he was in fact rather ill. He had headache, breathlessness, he had some bleeding from his nose, and also when I sent him to the uh, ophthalmologist, he had some retinopathy. So I thought he should have an urgent need of plasmapheresis. The outcome after the plasmapheresis was excellent, and we started the DRC. He had a reduction of the M component uh, very fast, but that could also be due to the plasmapheresis before. He had, in fact, problems with rituximab infusion because it was like very severe reactions, not only the first infusion, but also the second and the third one. And moreover, he didn't have a very good response. His Hemoglobin was decreasing, and also he had now worsening of the thrombocytopenia. And the spleen was enlarged. He, he also had a weight loss, which worried him a lot. I did a bone marrow to look at the disease, and it was still a very high infiltration of tumor cells. And they, some of the cells now, had some plasma cells which were CD20 negative but CD138 positive. So that might be something when you think of the new therapy. And he was now not responding to the DRC and we have to think of other drugs. And of course there are many other drugs out there like Everolimus, which I don't think is a good option for this patient with the fully packed marrow, and lenalidomide uh, has been effective, but also uh, had some problems with an unclear anemia in Waldenstrom patients. So what you always think of when you have a high M component or, or a resistant patients is the proteasome inhibitors, and they could be very effective, and also in combination, you could combine them with rituximab and dexamethasone, and now there is also a new uh, proteasome inhibitor, carfilzomib, which have been shown to be effective also in combination. And that is a drug which, in uh, comparison to bortezomib, has less uh, nevropathy uh, problems. But still, for this patient, he was an old gentleman, and he had some small problems from the peripheral nerves. So, Bortezomib or carfilzomib was not an option for him. So now I was thinking of the new drugs. Ibrutinib, the BTK inhibitor, has been, of course, very popular also among patients because they have an oral drug. And Ibrutinib, Imbruvica, is now also approved by FDA. But there are some complications, and for Waldenstrom patients, I am a bit hesitant for the bleeding complications, as this patient already had a nose bleeding and had some uh, thrombocytopenia. Moreover, he had um, a tumor mass. Cydelic or idelalisib is also one of the new drugs which could be an option for a patient with Waldenstrom, and trials are still ongoing. So my patient now, he could have another drug, like Vendamustin, which is an old, well-known drug. And I might give it in combination with Rituximab. Vendamustin, you see from this slide, is a drug which has been effective as to progression-free survival, which is better in all subgroups, and especially you could see here in the Wallenstrom, where the progression-free survival is much better compared to our CHOP. So 
I have some more data to support my treatment choice for this old gentleman. He had some peripheral neuropathy, but he had no anti-mag antibodies. So still, I didn't want to give him bortezomib. Moreover, this old gentleman had severe reactions to every rituximab infusion. And also, he had in the bone marrow a clone of plasma cells, which were CD20 negative. So rituximab was not a choice for this patient. But what about bendamustine? The patient had increasing spleen, so he, and he had a high tumor burden in the bone marrow. And he also had some renal insufficiency. And then I think bendamustine is a good alternative. So the patient got his second line uh, treatment with bendamustine. He was refractory to the DRC, but he had an excellent response to bendamustine alone. And he, in fact, got six courses of bendamustine, a bit reduced uh, in dose, but still. And his disease was really showing a good response. And you could see here on this slide that he converted from PR to CR after some more months after stopping treatment. And now, in fact, he is in a CR, and that is now two years ago. And I saw this old gentleman just one week ago, and he is so happy. He has no symptoms at all of the disease. And he, as a school teacher, told me that he has learned a lot about his disease and about treatments of Wallenstrom. And I hope you have also learned something. And if you want to learn more, I have some uh, uh, extra reading. You can look at that. I have some guidelines. I think you should read and also some of other publications. So thank you very much.